Chamber of Law, the Chief Justice, and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. I'm Carolyn Shapiro, Associate Professor of Law at Chicago Kent College of Law and Director of the Institute on the Supreme Court of the United States. I'm here today with my colleague, Kent Stressman, to talk about the Tax Anti-Injunction Act issue in the Affordable Care Act litigation in the Supreme Court. Kent, would you mind introducing yourself? And I'm Kent Stressman. I'm the director of the Ilana Diamond Rovner Program in Appellate Advocacy at Chicago Kent and an associate professor of appellate advocacy. So what is the Tax Anti-Injunction Act? It's an obscure provision uh, in the Internal Revenue Code, and uh, it quite simply uh, forbids any person from bringing a lawsuit that has the purpose of restraining the assessment or collection of any tax. So does this mean that if somebody pays a tax that they believe they shouldn't have, that they have no way of getting their money back? Not at all. Uh, it uh, operates really to control the timing uh, to a challenge uh, against a tax assessment. Uh, basically, it says that instead of uh, if you question a tax penalty, if you don't want to pay a tax penalty, you can't run to court and get an order from the court saying you don't have to pay it. Instead, the proper recourse usually is to go ahead and pay the disputed amount uh, and then obtain redress from a court after paying it. So what does this have to do with the Affordable Care Act? Well, uh, bottom line is, is it, it, it could stop the Affordable Care Act litigation in its tracks and uh, prevent courts from hearing these suits uh, until basically April of 2015. Would the Tax Anti-Injunction Act apply to the entire lawsuit or only to certain aspects of the litigation? Well, the, the, the challenges to the uh, so-called individual mandate, uh, the shared responsibility payment that is uh, assigned uh, and, and uh, the penalty that is assessed uh, as part of the tax code. So if somebody actually doesn't get insurance. Right. Those, those suits challenging those provisions uh, will be placed on hold uh, until uh, the penalty is actually assessed, and that wouldn't occur uh, until April 15th of 2015. So the, the question then is, do, do the penalties associated with the individual mandate constitute a tax? That's basically the question, yes. Uh, there's, there's a lot of complexity within that argument, but basically uh, the arguments boil down to that simple issue. Is it a tax or is it something else? Is it a penalty? Uh, if it's a tax, then the argument is a quite good one that the Anti-Injunction Act will bar these lawsuits until 2015. Well, how will the court tell if it is a tax? Uh, the, the first thing we do is look at what Congress uh, has, has called it, uh, and that's, that's certainly the argument that uh, the parties in this litigation are advancing, that Congress took a lot of pains in this uh, legislation not to use the term tax when talking about uh, the, the penalty for, for uh, failure to maintain minimum coverage. Uh, because they use the term penalty and don't use the term tax, uh, the argument goes that it shouldn't be treated as a tax and therefore the Anti-Injunction Act doesn't apply. Well, I would presume that Congress didn't use the word tax because the word tax is political kryptonite. Well, that's, that's probably the primary reason why they didn't use the term tax. But there are other things about the way this penalty functions, uh, the, the placement of it within the Internal Revenue Code, uh, the, the way that the penalty operates is somewhat different from other penalties that are explicitly in the Internal Revenue Code treated as taxes that helps support the argument that this really is something different from a tax, something different that is normally uh, not subject to challenge. So the, the penalty is in the Internal Revenue Code, but in some ways it doesn't look or act like everything else that's in the Internal Revenue Code. That's exactly right. Uh, it, it operates somewhat differently from uh, other penalties that are clearly and according to Congress's intent treated as taxes. What are the arguments that it is a tax? Uh, basically, it looks, it feels, it smells like a tax and Congress actually says that it should be assessed and collected in the way that any other tax would be. And so basically the argument goes that the, the semantics don't matter, that because it's part of the tax code because it works like a tax, because it, it functions as far as the citizenry goes as a tax, then it is a tax and the Anti-Injunction Act. 
one thing that's confusing here is that all of the parties are arguing that there is no tax at issue, and so the, anti, the Tax Anti-Injunction Act doesn't apply. But wouldn't the government want it to apply so that the lawsuit would have to stop? Well, initially, that, the, the government was, as is typical uh, in, in a lawsuit of this nature, uh, that it was, it was making the argument that the lawsuit should be stopped because of the Anti-Injunction Act. That was the position that the government pursued in, in most of the Affordable Air Act cases uh, at the trial court level. Uh, but it, it wasn't a terribly successful argument, and the government has come to the conclusion uh, that it would probably be best uh, for everyone involved to get these issues resolved in the courts now as opposed to having to wait until after 2015. That's a strategic decision. A strategic decision, it, it appears, yes, very much so. Does that mean that there is anyone in the Supreme Court making the argument that the Tax Anti-Injunction Act applies? Well, none of the parties are. Uh, the, the parties in this litigation, both the federal government and the states and the individuals who have challenged the act, they all agree that the Anti-Injunction Act shouldn't bar this, even though they disagree about some of the technicalities of, of how the Anti-Injunction Act operates. Normally, the court relies on the adversary system, on parties uh, to present the opposing sides uh, of the issue. Uh, and typically, courts feel like they need somebody to present uh, the opposing view on the issue. So what the court had to do in this case, in a, in a rare but not unprecedented move, uh, is appoint a lawyer, a friend of the court, uh, to present the arguments uh, both in writing and orally to the court uh, that the Anti-Injunction Act uh, does apply. In this case, there is no taxpayer or would-be taxpayer involved. Nobody has yet been assessed this penalty. Instead, what we have are states making the argument that the statute is unconstitutional. Right. Well, states and, and uh, individuals as well uh, pressing the argument. Uh, and uh, yes, I mean, that's one of the things that's highly unusual about this. It's, it's, it's rare to see a circumstance like this where, uh, pursuant to the Tax Injunction Act, the uh, tax being challenged uh, hasn't been assessed yet, uh, isn't in the process of being collected, and won't be. Uh, for several years. So that's uh, uh, one of the many features that make this case uh, so unusual and I think something that provides uh, at least something of an opening uh, for the Supreme Court to say, uh, look, this simply isn't the kind of case, the kind of action uh, to which Congress intended the Anti-Injunction Act to apply. Ordinarily the Tax Anti-Injunction Act applies where you have an individual taxpayer saying that I personally should not have to pay this particular tax. Exactly. Usually a circumstance where it is a, a, an immediate challenge uh, to a tax. Here there's a much broader constitutional challenge to the entire statute. And, and as the, the, uh, the pet uh, petitioners in this case, the plaintiffs in this case, uh, have advanced, they're really saying they're not ultimately challenging the penalty provision at all. What they're striking at is that mandate, that order that everybody has to maintain a minimum level of insurance. It's only ancillary, really, that they're challenging the, uh, the tax penalty that's associated with it. On the other hand, one of the arguments that the government is making for why Congress had the power to enact an individual mandate in the first place is that Congress did so pursuant to its taxing power. Wouldn't that mean that the penalty, in fact, is a tax? Well, I mean, it, it, the government really has, has sort of put itself in a position of threading the needle in this case. Uh, in its arguments to the Supreme Court, the government is making the argument that the taxing power in the Constitution allows it to impose the mandate and allows it to impose uh, the penalty. Uh, and the uh, argument that the government is making there is saying, look, because this thing looks, feels, smells like a tax, it's an appropriate exercise of the government's taxing power. But that doesn't, the federal government is saying, uh, transform this into a, this, this set of lawsuits into the sort of action that would be barred by the Anti-Injunction Act. So it is a tax for purposes of the Constitution, but it's not a tax for purposes of the Anti-Injunction Act. Uh, that's something of a, of a difficult balancing act to maintain, and it's going to be very interesting to see how the court responds to it. Normally, when the parties agree, as they do here, that the Tax Anti-Injunction Act does not apply, there's nothing for the Supreme Court to decide. Why isn't that the case here? Well, that really has to do with the, the role of the courts and the power of the courts. Uh, the, the basic understanding of the Anti-Injunction Act, although the parties will argue about this, is that it's a jurisdictional bar, that it forbids courts from exercising power 
over a class of cases. And so that means that even if the parties want to have the court resolve their dispute, uh, that the court just doesn't, as a matter of the way the government is structured, have the power uh, to hear that suit. And typically where questions of whether the court has the power to hear a suit at all come up, they're the sort of things that a court has to resolve, and it has to resolve uh, at, at the outset of the dispute in order to go on and reach the uh, what are deemed to be the more lofty and important questions in this case. And that's why uh, this is going to be one of the first uh, arguments presented in the five and a half hours of oral argument in this case. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Carolyn.